here on the Vocal Minority. Are you part of the silent majority, or are you part of the vocal minority? Let's go. Attention, please, attention, please. If America can be saved, and I don't know if it's too late, but it'll be two radio shows. Like this, this new crime. This shit here feels like the whole entire world collapse. It's the vocal minority. The revolution will be live. What's good? It's your boy, MC. You know, there was a guy that said he refused to listen to our episode 12, Alibis and Technicalities with Asia McLean Chapman, because I say it's your boy at the top of the show. How crazy is that, right? He said he wouldn't listen to anyone who talked like that. Well, it's definitely his loss. He missed out on a great episode that we did with the famed alibi witness in the storied case made famous by This American Life, Serial, hosted by Sarah Koenig. His comments do, however, bring up an important point regarding AAVE. That's African American Vernacular English and the use of it. I recently heard Dallas Cowboys star wide receiver Des Bryant talking, and he said something like he knew he had chemistry with the rookie quarterback off the rip. And it got me to thinking there's a show there about the language, our use of language versus perception. So stay tuned for that. We're also working on a spinoff show where we report on and tell the stories of true crime events and the victims of those crimes. We're also thinking of launching a Patreon campaign. I'm still very hesitant, despite pretty much everyone else having one and obviously being okay with the idea of asking uh, listeners to commit some dollar amount per month or per episode. So, And even some of you have, a limited few of you all, have graciously mentioned it to me because you like the work and the people we bring on. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, In the meantime, though, make sure you go to Facebook and like our page. It's the Vocal Minority Report. Go to iTunes, leave a rating and review. That's really helpful. We're trying to get some additional notice. Use the hashtag the Vocal Minority to tweet the show when you're listening. Follow us on Twitter at Vocal Report, or you can email the show your comments, questions, ideas, anything you have, vocalreport at gmail.com. So without further ado, welcome to another episode of the Vocal Minority Report. Got another great show. As always, you could have downloaded any podcast in the world, but you're here with us. We still appreciate that. We've got Robbie Chowdhury on the show today. She's basically the chief advocate for Adnan Syed, who was convicted in the murder of his ex-girlfriend, Heyman Lee. After speaking with Asia McLean, Rebecca Lavoie, host of Crime Writers On, and she also does the audio for the Undisclosed podcast that Rabia hosts with Susan Simpson and Colin Miller. She was on episode 14 prior to Judge Welch's ruling, and we also had the pleasure of having Bob Ruth from the Truth and Justice podcast on episode 21. So needless to say, I've been waiting to talk to Rabia. I hope you all enjoy. Oh, and Susan Simpson, Colin Miller, Sarah Koenig, you guys are next on the list. We'll talk to you at the episode. Our guest today is a New York Times bestselling author, lawyer, noted agitator, mother, friend, and cat lover. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the great Robbie Chowdhury to the show. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Pat, I'm good. Thanks. I really appreciate you coming on. I want to talk about you and your at Ad- Adnan and his story. Of course, I mean that's the title of the book. But I wanted to kind of ask you about you for a little bit. You know, I your brief bio there captures some of you. But I left out another part of your title that always interests me, and it's. Right now, you're a Jennings Randolph Senior Fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And before that, it was New America. You're at the New America Foundation, which just sound like cool places and titles. And so I'm, I'm just curious if you could yeah. tell us about, I guess a little bit about your legal career 
prior to all this and the current work that you do, or I don't know how much time you have to do in uh, the capacities at, as a senior fellow? Sure. So, um, you know, I practiced, um, I mean, I, I'm still a licensed attorney. I maintain my license just in case. Um, but I practiced immigration and did some civil rights work for, I think, I don't know, I lose track, 12, 13, 14 years, um, even as I was wrapping up uh, the practice, it takes it, it takes time to even wrap up. <laughs> so you'll have some straggling cases that go on for a while. Um, and then about five years ago, I started moving into policy work because, um, first of all, I was a little bit burned out from practice, but also I, uh, coming into, I, I mean, I had lived in the D.C. area for a while, then I moved out to Connecticut, um, and I had my own practice there, but when we moved back, um, I realized that there was a lot, there was a lot happening. It was post 9-11, um, there was a lot of issues around national security and especially policing of Muslim communities that concerned me and that had directly impacted my, uh, my own clients. So I was interested in working on those issues, like from a policy perspective, and that's how I ended up uh, at New America Foundation. They knew a little bit about my work. I had uh, founded an organization called Safe, Safe Nation collaborative, not even an organization, it was really a business, where um, me and other fellow trainers, we trained law enforcement and also Muslim communities on how to work uh, together respectfully and really understand um, what was happening on, on, on the domestic end in terms of like domestic threats and stuff, because the perception is very different from the reality. So we've been doing that work, and Peter Bergen at the America Foundation is very well known in the field of counterterrorism, you know, he's his interview with Osama bin Laden from forever ago is very famous. Um, knew a little bit about this work, and he invited me to join them to run a program that was funded by Google, Facebook, Twitter on how to on basically teaching uh, Muslim advocates in the U.S. American Muslim advocates on uh, how to use social media better. Because what was happening since 2009 was uh, you have violent extremist groups using. Uh, social media tools really, really well. So I ran that for a couple of years, and that was it was really a tremendous experience, and I learned a lot. And all this happened before Serial, but uh, it came in very handy for me, too. Right. I learned a lot during Serial. But then um, I finished that up last summer in America, and then I took a, a conscientious break so I could write the book. And as I was writing the book, I was approached by um, somebody at the U.S. Institute of Peace which, I mean, both the America Foundation and the U.S. Institute of Peace are really, really well-regarded, um, like, think tanks and do tanks in D.C. Uh, and USIP in particular is really a government entity. It's like a, and kind of a pseudo-state department um, arm, and they do peace building and conflict resolution um, globally. They don't do domestic work. So I was approached by them. They said we have this fellowship, and we really think you'd be good for it. We'd like you to put in a proposal about some kind of research you'd like to do with us. So I, um, and this is all kind of within this field of work called CVE, which is counting about extremism. So I pulled, put, put together a research proposal. Um, actually, I'm sorry, it's, it's what's the middle words? Counter what extremism? extremism? What is it? I'm sorry. Countering violent extremism. Okay, CVE, I got you. Countering violent extremism. Yep. I was, got you, okay. Uh, which, you know, that's like a, a whole two-hour discussion on its own because it, it, it means almost nothing in everything. <laughs> it can be a <laughs> okay. lot of different things. But um, this was something that USIP in the last couple of years has also been focusing on, and you know, that, and it makes sense in conjunction with their peace building work. So I put together a research proposal that I wanted to do research in in Pakistan and um, and in Sri Lanka on how ideologically extreme groups that use religion, like how they do recruitment amongst young young people, college age people. And that's I'm in the middle of that research um, right now, and I'll be I've traveled to the region once um, and have local partners there, and I'll be going again really in about a month to um, continue to do the research. So all that is like ongoing, and that's, it's a year-long fellowship, but it's just a, a, an amazing opportunity to work with as high-level experts, and you get, um, you get a lot of freedom and uh, flexibility in the work, which is why I can juggle a lot of things, which I am right now. But um, So that's, that's that work. <laughs> okay, cool. No, well, that's very interesting, and I think it speaks to the the obviously other great work that you're doing. I mean, crusade might be too strong of a term or might even be cliche. I don't mean it that way, but you know, it, it to me, it kind of fits your role in, uh, wait for it, Adnan's story. So, um, right. in, in, in this whole thing. So, I, so that's a good place to, and, and obviously most people listening, you know, are, are familiar, um, with the, the unfortunate 
murder of Heyman Lee and the subsequent unfortunate in, uh, incarceration of Adnan Syed. So, so I guess we can start there and talk about the book that uh, I have in my hands now and, and many others. I, I, I was made a joke. I should start live tweeting it because I was reading. I'm like, man, this is just like, <laughs> like, like I was, there, there's so much there. So I guess if we can start there. I hope you're enjoying it. Oh yeah, um, that most definitely. I it's it's funny because it's it's kind of like kind of like undisclosed on steroids, you know. <laughs> you know, and I like I like that. You know, undisclosed gave you, which is the podcast that uh, you, Colin Miller, Susan Simpson, now John Cryer, are producing about obviously Adnan's case. But so so yeah, no, I'm enjoying the book a great deal, and I, I guess I'll now give you the opportunity to tell people about the book and what you were attempting to capture or, you know, have captured in the, in the book. And then we can get into some more specific questions I have about Adnan and, uh, and Joey, the, the new case, and then also just sure. you guys work. Yeah. So, um, the book, uh, happened not because I had ever any intention of writing a book, kind of like the podcast underscore. I had no intention of ever doing a podcast, but I was approached by, um, as I was blogging during Serial, I mean, like, well, you know, Serial was ongoing, and every week I was blogging about it and writing a lot and tw- obviously tweeting a lot. Um, there was a literary agent, uh, Lauren Abramo, who um, contacted me because she was reading my stuff, and she said, listen, you're a good writer. Have you ever thought about writing a book? And I kind of got all excited because um, I've thought about writing a book for years, but I thought she meant like a novel or something. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was like, I have a couple novels I've started, and she's like, oh, that's really sweet, but I'm, you know, I'm thinking about a non case. Um, and I initially really balked at the idea because for a number of different reasons. First of all, um, even as Sarah was, you know, going through the story, um, you know, these were thousands of pages of documents that I hadn't seen in a long time, and she now had the documents. She had sent them to me electronically, but I. At the time, working full time, you know, responding to serial, being on social media, didn't even have the time. I didn't feel like I had the time to really thoroughly go through the documents. I certainly had never had the investigative skills to figure out to unpack what was happening. And uh, and I and I was like, you know, for me to write about this case, I was like, I don't even feel like I'm equipped to write about. It. I can write about what happened, right? You know, from a personal perspective, um, I can help him not tell his story. But even there, there's limitations because. Until that month gets out, we're not going to know the casual story. But anyhow, she she made a great argument. She said, "Look, if you don't write about the case, somebody else is going to. And if it bo- if, if serial bothers you, you know, a book might bother you. Know, if there's things about not being able to tell the story the way you want the story tell, told um, is, is problematic for you, then you have to just consider that." She's like, "But somebody will write a book about this right. case. Okay, there's just no way around it." So I thought, okay, that's hard for me to argue with. It's true. And I said, okay, I have to talk to Adnan. So we, I discussed it with him a couple of times, and, and, and he said that if I was up to it, because um, he knew I was kind of overwhelmed, uh, that he would be okay with it. And so I went back and said, look, I would be really see you. <laughs> and, uh, and I wanted not to contribute to it because his voice being a part of it is very important. Um, and we put, I put together a proposal, and within a month it was sold. So that's how it came about. That's crazy. You know, I, I guess it's, I, I don't know. You, I, I mean, obviously it's the events are unfortunate, but everything that spawned, you know, in the last, what are you like, 28 months or so? I'm trying to, when did serial come out? October, yeah. somewhere, somewhere around there, yeah, you know. Yeah, it'll be, yeah, yeah it'll be like two, it's two years since serial began. And I'm almost three since I contacted Sarah. So almost three since you contacted Sarah. And then, and then everything else is just, not, I mean, it started all this consecutive and overlapping these movements of exoneration and fights for justice. So, so obviously it, it is and about and remains about Adnan, but you know, I, I talked to Bob Ruff about this a little bit. Just how do you feel? Just even you contacting Sarah prior to this, the book and everything, and, and what that's done for both Adnan's case and and just everything you know, and that's led from that, you know, and and now the book and the reach. It's probably a hard question to to, to quantify, <laughs> but but does that make you feel? It, yeah, I mean, look, I, Sarah and Serial, like, they just, they opened the door for every possibility in this case. That's really what happened. It wasn't just about, obviously, if Serial had happened and everything stopped there, right, we would not have a new conviction. We, we I'm sorry, we would not have a, a new trial. We would not, right. the conviction not have been vacated. But what Serial was able to do is 
bring the public attention, that was really important, number one, because even without that, having, see, the sad thing is, you can have a case, and this happens all the time, where you have really, um, really amazing and important new evidence, you have great investigators and lawyers doing what they should be doing, and they, and you still lose your appeal. And, uh, having the public spotlight makes, it does, it shouldn't make a difference, but it does make a difference. And so, and I knew that, I knew that because I had followed other wrongful conviction cases and I saw what a difference it made. Uh, but other than that public intention, she brought, um, resources to us. People came to us. People listened to this and said, I think I can do something for you guys. I have, uh, information for you guys. I, you know, I was Susan and Colin came to the case because of serial. Asia McLean came back to the case because of serial. So nothing could have happened without them, um, but also nothing much would have happened if so many people didn't, like, pick up the story afterwards. Um, so it's not like you can, like, the, the credit goes to, like, hundreds of different people. Like, right. Trying to say. Um, for me, it's always like, I mean, yesterday is when I found out that the book has become a New York Times bestseller, and I don't know. Congratulations, yeah. If it, Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if it's, um, like, I feel like I'm on this really fast merry-go-round for the last couple of years that I can't get off of. And until I get off of it, I almost feel like I can't just, you know, I know what's happened is amazing, almost miraculous, but just being kind of in the eye of it, it's, it's been really hard to uh, slow down and, and take stock of it because even the New York Times thing, I was like, well, that's great. Okay, now what next? <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, right, yes. I mean, it's, <laughs> ridiculous, but I know it's a big deal, but I, um, you know, I'm, I, I just, I was, uh, I got home last night after a couple of stops in California in the book tour, and I was, right now, before I talked to you, I was taking a nap, and I had a dream, in the, I mean, like, this is what I'm always upset, I had a dream that Justin called me, and Justin found some new, and Justin Brown is his lawyer, uh, that Justin had found the new evidence, and I woke up, and I was like, I gotta contact Justin. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I'm always, like, thinking about, like, what's next, what's next. Right. I'm sure you probably are in the fog of war, right? So yeah, it's hard to get that true perspective, when, especially when, yeah. as we talk about the time frame, and, and you know, I, I mean, the unfortunate thing, obviously, is that Adnan is still in prison. So I wonder, you know, even even when I'm, you know, I if I'm talking to someone about the case or reading or whatever, you know, it goes back to like, as I mentioned before, Adnan's a year older than me, I believe, and I'm always like, I just think about my the last. 17 years of my life, I have two children, blah, 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 you know, just, and, and I'm a, you know, so everything positive that happens or even whatever, I'm always just like, man, but my man is still, he's still there, you know, and I, I wonder if that help, if that helps add that certain level of levity where you can't, you can't get too high or too low or really truly appreciate what is in front of you in, in, with these accolades and or attention, not to trivialize them, but because the the man that you believe your friend your brother's best friend is has been wrongfully convicted and still sits there correct no absolutely look and getting him home like you know we have more hope now than we've ever had like ever had in seventeen years we still, there's still no guarantee to anything right and so it is still a precarious situation although I think I think it's inevitable at this point um, that he will eventually be not just freed but exonerated. Um, but at the same time, there, I, we'll, I, we'll, I don't think anybody understands that, well, how the family was affected, how all of us were affected. I mean, I, my, you know, I've been married to my husband now for almost 11 years, and for my second marriage, for my first husband to my second husband, they have, like, watched me and my family fall through this and cry a thousand times, and, uh, because the tragedy of it is never going to go away. Those years are not going to go back to him. His family's not going to be healed. And what it did to our community is not going to change how the state treated our community, you know, they're never going to apologize to us. Um, and we have systematic issues. Those same detectives, those same prosecutors have touched other cases. Um, and as somebody who's never really done criminal defense work or worked on wrongful convictions, um, and now we have, like, a world of these things happening, like, you know, Bob's working, Bob Ruff's working, I and mean, so many other people, so many stories are coming forward. The, the sadness and anger and frustration is, not just going to be about Adnan's case. It's going to be about so many other cases. It's going to be about the lack of accountability in the entire system that allows this to continue to happen. I feel like, I was like, the people who were surprised about this, I'm like, what's, why are you guys surprised now? You know, like, what, like obviously this story is, is very compelling, but I'm like, you know, obviously wrongful convictions and, and everything, this has been going on for a long, long time. And it's 
systemic in certain areas, as, as you mentioned. I'm glad that all of these shows, subsequent work gets to highlight, you know, the, the true wrongs. But like I said, that, that, but the reality is, is that your someone you know is there. Let's get, you know, get him out and, and, and tell his story. So, and I guess in the book, you know, one thing I did not expect, and I, I, I'm sure you've probably talked about this previously is that, you know, it's, it's truly Adnan's story. You know, that's your thoughts, memories, actual Adnan's, the bold print of, of his actual words and, and reflections of the time and, and whatever chapter. So I, I thought that was a pretty, obviously amazing way to be able to tell his story and weave his actual words in there. Can you talk about that a little bit, that process? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I agreed to write the book, and, um, but I only wanted to do it with his contributions, I... And what I did was I had sketched out this outline that, okay, these would be like the chapters and honestly the book, uh, in the end is not, is not exactly follow that flow chart, but, um, I, I had written to Adnan and I mean, I had spoken on the phone. I explained that, you know, for these chapters, whichever chapters you want to write for, like, the, can you contribute something for each chapter? So, um, so for the, you know, for the chapter, let's say that, and for the first chapter, and I was like, you can contribute something about, basically about your relationship with Hay, like what it was like to be in school then, what it was like when you found out she um, was missing, all these things. So um, he, over the course of three or four months, wrote me letters, and he wrote, typed up these contributions on his uh, uh, really old, really, really old word processor. Um, and we, you know, so the originals are, you know, and I can't, at this point, we went back and forth with the editor so many times that I can't remember, I can't remember if the originals are in there, if we retype them, because some of the quality in some of them was, was not very good. Oh, okay, I gotcha. So, um, yeah, because his word processor would run out of ink, the tape, you know I mean? Like, it's one of those old school ones. The fact that you're calling um, it a word processor, processor lets, it, lets me know that it's old school, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the best he's got. Um, he can handwrite stuff too, but that that can be hard because when he's writing, like you know, obviously hundreds of pages. Of course. So and he did, and you know, there there are actually entire sections he wrote that we we didn't have the space. The book just it, it went too long. Um, you know, I had we ended up having eight hundred fifty pages total. The end of <laughs> the end of it all. Good. And obviously, almost you know, four hundred had to be more than four hundred had to be cut. It was just too much. So you know. Um, I, my editor gets a lot of credit for making also the book you know, look good because a lot had to be, um, you know, cut and edited properly and, you know. So, um, that was the process for that. And, you know, throughout this, I became more and more, more aware of the fact that, you know, it's, it's really a non because of his situation where he's at. Um, he's just not in a safe space where he can, well, he can really tell us what his experience has been like, right? I mean, I know he's probably got hundreds of stories of what growing up in prison has been like, of, you know, of going through, I'm sure, tremendous periods of, um, in depression and finding, you know, support and maybe feeling threatened sometimes. Like all, I mean, all those things, he, until he's out, he's not going to go tell us about those. It's good too, because I mean, the last time we actually heard from Adnan, I I don't remember what episode serial that would have been where we heard his actual voice. So you know, just to, to hear his words and capture and to be able to, I mean, the the level of trust, you know, and and even the first letter that you have that that he wrote to Sarah Koenig, I mean, it, it's so powerful to to read that and to and to to really put it in perspective, his thought process and why he felt compelled to even to start all of this. So you did a beautiful job with the book and, and everything in it and his contributions. Okay. So, uh, yeah, no, no problem. So, so I guess shifting to him and everything that's happened, you know, why he's in prison, you know, it's yesterday I happened to turn on the TV and this is going to sound like I'm making this up, but the remake of 12 angry men was on. Right. And literally, oh, the, I didn't know they remade it. <laughs> you really haven't it's uh they remade it like in the nineties with, it's got, it's a multi, Cultural cast has got like Jack Lemon, Courtney B. Vance, Tony Danza, Edward oh, James no Olmos. That yeah. sounds actually great. It, I, um, it, it is I great. I've seen the original. I've seen the original many times, but I'm going to see if I can find the uh, remake now. Yeah, it, it's 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 great because it, it's um you know especially for that time you know 15 years ago all those people were more relevant and or alive <laughs> but but um <laughs> right. but but no it's 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 really good though and but the 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 scene that they were obviously deliberating and. Literally, the first line I hear was, 
being accused of murder isn't supposed to give him an infallible memory. And I was like, <laughs> what? I was like, how crazy, how I propose that for this conversation that, you know, that's the first yeah. um, thing that I would hear, you know, knowing that I was going to talk to you the next day. So, and obviously, you know, memory has, has been at the, the, the crux of, of this case, relatively speaking. And I, I wanted to ask you about that and starting with the memory or lack thereof, especially now that, you know, Adnan has gone back and contributed to the book and added his story. So you obviously you've had a conversation with Adnan directly. Can you speak to what, how difficult it is to kind of investigate and do what you're trying to do when, you know, the memories and, and the people involved, like, I have actually have a lot to say about the, the, the issue of memory here. Number one, uh, it's not about memory being old or new. Um, it's that people have infallible memories, even if you have a group of people who witness the exact same thing and they are interviewed immediately afterwards, they will remember different parts of it. This has been scientifically shown. Um, people will witness the same exact incident and immediately afterwards have different reports. And you have this happen all the time in crime, even something like the San Bernardino shooting. Something like that, immediately afterwards, there were reports of, it was six, it was like five or six, you know, gunmen who were tall and but And then, I mean, you ha this happens all the time in investigations. So that's why you cannot rely on people's memories alone. We, our brains are not they're not like video cameras, right? We just, there's things that stick out, there's trauma that happens, there's a lot of things that happen that impair his memory. So I want to, but setting that aside, um, I actually want to challenge the idea that this case is about memory. I know that's how Sarah Koenig set this up, but it was set up in a way that I think makes, although it makes the story very interesting, I don't think it was entirely true. Because, and that's why when we started Undisclosed, we started Undisclosed with the very first episode was Adnan's day. Right. Uh, because we wanted to show that it wasn't that Adnan had no idea what happened that day, which is exactly how it was framed in Serial. Um, it was that he had a, he had a very clear memory of many things. The only, like the, his school day. But when he was arrested, which was like literally two months, almost, you know, almost two months after that day, um, after school, like he knew he had track practice, he knew he was in school. In that moment of time in between, he was like, I normally, between track practice, or between school and track practice, either just spend time in school or I'll go home. And, and that was it. The big thing is, we don't, we don't, we're not even sure what he told the police at that, that time, because after six hours of interrogation, they didn't take any notes. What he has told me is, I just told him I was at school the whole time. He said, I never left the campus until after track practice. Um, I don't know if he was able to tell the audience exactly, but when Asia sent the letters, he remembered it. Right. He was like, oh my God, that's true. That did happen. But when Gutierrez came back to him, now imagine, he completely trusts his attorney. Why would his attorney, in a murder first case, like, it's beyond the scope of imagination that an attorney would not check out an alibi. Um, he told her, and he brought it up numerous times to her, and it's in their notes numerous times, right? Asia McLean, Asia McLean, check out Asia McLean. She came back and said, Asia had the wrong day. I checked it out. It wasn't January 13th. And that, that took away his memory. You, you see what I'm saying? Okay, I right. explained what he remembered. And he was like, and that was so unfair to him because he was like, I thought that's what happened that day. And now he's being told it didn't. And he just got all confused. Um, and he told me once, he's like, you know, he's like, I just saw it. Okay, you know what? After, like that evening after I broke my fast, I did smoke some pot. He said, maybe that like clouded my memory. But, and I'm not remembering that day. Like, but I did remember seeing Asia and her boyfriend and her friend, uh, his friend came into the library to pick her up. Um, and it just completely, for a 17 year old, I mean, like, what else can you expect him to do? And all of a sudden he was left with nothing. So, and the idea that, like, he had no idea what he did is complete. Um, he had a very good idea what he did. He remembered going to Moss that night. He remembered reviewing his notes because he was giving a talk the next day. He remembered dropping Jay off uh, at Jay's house and not at Westview Mall like Jay and Jen. Um, well, Jen testified to, and although Jay actually, this is another thing, like Jen said, oh, I picked Jay up at Westview Mall um, and he was there with a gun. And Jay actually testified that, no, you know, that picked me up from home. Which is what his mom remembers. He remembers that he dropped him off at home. And I'm, I'm gonna, does, does it seem, and this is just me offering my own opinion, 
does it seem like Jen? Like she's so confusing to me, and I'm just from the, like, what was she doing? Like her story, like I, I don't even see the point of her, her stories changing, and why she could not link up and sync up with Jay. Like if you're gonna protect your boy, then I would think you would try to do it in a better place. I, I guess there's really no question there, but I mean, we're talking about a bunch of kids. We're talking about a bunch of kids who couldn't get their story straight, uh, and that's what it was. And I don't think Jen knew anything about. See, Jay had been meeting with the police for at least a week or two weeks before they ever got to Jen. And I don't think he had ever any intention of Jen getting involved. He didn't want them. He didn't want anybody getting involved. Uh, he was just dealing with, with it on his own. But the, the police got to Jen, and then Jen's like, I think what happened that the first time they went to her, she was like, uh, I'm on my, I can't talk right now. I'm on my way to see my boyfriend. But she was actually on her way to see Jay. Um, she met with Jay, and I think that's when Jay was like, listen, just back me up on this. Because he probably did spend that time where he probably, Jay, he did spend the evening with Jen, like he saw her that night. Maybe was he was at her house during the day, I have no idea, because he says he spent the day with her brother playing video games. Right. But he never took notes. We have no <laughs> evidence that they ever took a statement from her brother. Um, and I think what happened was Jen just went along with it, and I think the police knew that it was complete bullshit, that Jen, Jen was just corroborating Jay, and they needed that. They needed Jay's story to be corroborated because... They also knew that Jay's story was crap. I mean, that's the only way I can explain two things here. One is that if you're to take, if you're a police officer and you're to take what Jen is telling you seriously, that I helped basically dispose of evidence in a murder, um, that comes with a charge of accessory after the fact. She was a charge. She was charged with no. She just walked. Okay, and I think she went and gave the statement knowing she would walk. The police probably already told them that you know nothing's going to happen. Just back this up here. And the second thing is the police never went to look for the shovels for like another two months, right? Right. Like, or, or month or month, six weeks, something crazy. I mean, like, if they believed this, why would they wait that long to look for the murder burial weapons? Right. It, or, or the burial tool, the tools, sorry. And, and they wouldn't do that. They, right. It was just because they knew it was all bullshit. It, it did, none of it happened. And they had to just, you know, but she was useful. And these same officers have done the same thing in other cases where they find witnesses who tell them I don't know what you're talking about. I got nothing to do with this. They get they real with those witnesses, and they become useful witnesses. It's, there's just so many layers to this onion. You know, it, it just it seems so. It's, it's like a mixture of you know ineptness and, and and intentionality. You know, like what do you think is is majorly at play in this specific case? Is it is it a combination of I mean, I would say that it begins um, with a really poor investigation. And, you know, I, much of it, before it even gets to the prosecutor, begins with a really poor investigation. But the prosecutor also went to that poor investigation. And proof of that is this. That it's not until after Don is arrested. They decide who they want, right? They build a case. They arrest Don. And then they actually go and start gathering evidence, like getting witness statements. None of Don's peers are interviewed, like the school peers are interviewed, until after he's arrested. Teacher's not interviewed until after he's because they're just looking for things to use against him at this point. Another uh, proof positive about this is, is like forensic. None of that stuff is gathered until after he's arrested. Why? Like it, it, to me, excuse my language, ask backwards. I would assume, I would think, and the public would probably assume that the police look at all the forensic, get everything tested, and then say, then they say, oh, okay, that's our suspect, right? Right? Because this is what the evidence points to. But they didn't do that. All that testing is done after Adnan is arrested because they're looking for a certain result. And when they don't find it, what do they do? They let it drop. Oh, we've got hair. It doesn't match Jay. It doesn't match Adnan. It doesn't match Hay. That's it. That's, they don't go anywhere with it. They don't go back and say, let's, let's try to match this with other people in her life, like her current boyfriend, like people in her family, like uh, any other people she could have met online because she, she used to chat online. Anybody else in the school? They just drop it. They at, pay fingerprints in her car that, that don't match anybody. They just drop it. The fact that they never fingerprinted her current boyfriend, right? They never took hair samples from him is an egregious oversight in any kind of criminal investigation. It's ridiculous. So the, the way they conducted the, the investigation was completely backwards. Now having said that, I do think if it not have had competent defense, she could have pointed all this out. Right. Um, she just, so, but what people have to understand is, as unbelievable as all it is, it takes all of these elements. Anytime you have a wrong conviction, it means everybody fails. It means 
The police got it wrong. The prosecutor got it wrong. The defense counsel failed. And the defendant couldn't provide a defense for themselves, right? I mean, Deirdre Enright said in Serial that innocent people are like, they're the worst, right? <laughs> right. They, they can't even come up with an alibi, right? If they could come up with an alibi they could prove, they would not be wrongfully convicted. But that's how you end up with a wrongful conviction. Yeah, I remember her saying that. Yeah, the mundane, you just don't remember. I don't know. I was at the house. Why would I remember? Yeah, it's, you're not able to aid in your defense. So, you know, I, mean, I talked with Bob about, you know, ineffective assistance of, of counsel and, and obviously realizing the difference, you know, it being an effective tool in trying to overturn a conviction, you know, either that you may use it if the attorney truly dropped the ball, like in the case of Christina Gutierrez, or, you know, if, if it did not go well for whatever reason, sometimes an attorney, it feels like they may fall on the sword and, and swallow that in, in order to get the person who they believe wrong, wrongfully convicted out. But in, in this case, it just seems like, I don't know. I mean, so, I mean, you mentioned Christina Gutierrez and, and you, you've done tons of episodes on, on, on Goose, but I guess you can't really place. Cause, okay. So, so here, what about this though? We talk about this, but what about the juries though? Like, I, I don't want to be critical of these, you know, 12 people or whatever, but I'm going to say, what do you find or would you find, and maybe not specific to Adnan's case, but you find culpability for the jury and the outcome? If, if, if the evidence is crap and the. Yeah, I'll tell you, um, I'll tell you where I find culpability for the jury, um, in this case and in other cases like this, is I don't think any judge should accept the verdict of a jury that deliberates in a murder one conviction after a trial that lasted six weeks for two hours. Okay. Something is not right there. You cannot review evidence in six hours. I'm sorry, in two hours after six weeks of uh, trial. And that is a clear sign that something is wrong here, right? Unless there is like such overwhelming evidence, and maybe that's how the jury felt. But you know, in this situation, uh, although I do, I mean, look, I was there at times, and I, I swear to God, I do times when there are members of the jury who, who fell asleep. Um, I might have too, because Gutierrez was a disaster in the courtroom. Right. Um, and I've been saying this all along. I, she, there were moments in the second trial where I just, I was like, what is happening? I don't even know what's happening here. Like, she's just repeating things and repeating things. And I don't know what the, like, nobody could figure out what the point was. Like, I couldn't tell what the point of her questioning, line of questioning was. Um, and I don't think it's hard to understand why the jury reached the verdict they did, because what the state did was, the state was like, boom, witness, right? Witness of the burial, boom, uh, cell phone evidence. That's their science to corroborate the witness. The chair didn't put on a defense. Her case lasted two days. She didn't say, hey, guess what? The same witness are presenting, this is how his statements have changed. Guess what? They're saying that, the, that she was dead by 236, but Jay has testified in front of you that he was at Jen's house till 345. Right, right. I mean... Like, I mean, these are very simple things, you know, if she contacted now by witness. So I do lay the blame for that, um, at Gutierrez's feet. And, you know, she wasn't confident to be handling it. She also wasn't very kind. And I know people say, well, she was sick. Well, I mean, she was sick and she was horrible. I mean, she was not a nice person. <laughs> right, right. She could be both. And she was Correct. both. And yeah. I also think she was kind of corrupt. So I think there were a lot of things happening with Gutierrez. Uh, but I don't think any judge should accept the verdict of a jury that's only out for a couple of hours. In fact, I would I even wonder if there's a way to systematically um, set up a process where a jury has to be able to really articulate, you know, why, you know. Right. They, they come back and say, guilty. That's it. And it, 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 it's not enough to me. But you should have, be able to like, articulate why. Why did you reach that conclusion? Um but yeah, there, there is some culpability with the jury, and I. You know what? That's the jurors are people, though. That's um, I agree that they're people, but I I like your solution because I've been I've been thinking about what is cause I've never served on a jury before. I I don't know, like listen, my mom's been a hundred times. I feel like, and I don't know why, but I've never been <laughs> I've never been uh, on a jury. But come up with a, an argument and present it to the judge, independent. I want like, and then the, to be able to support your the time you took in the actual decision you're rendering because obviously that's going to affect someone's life so okay you know that that um... yeah, imagine then imagine if back then a, a judge had questioned the foreman and said can you tell us why you reached this conclusion and a, a foreman or a juror said well we know in arab culture that men mistreat their women i mean like you know which is something that somebody said one of them said to sarah Koenig. right 
it, it was maybe that judge would say, nope, not good enough, go back and keep deliberating. Uh, and that's what it should have taken. Yeah, no, I, well, and I, and I agree. It's true of so many of these cases where they, they act so quickly. You're expecting, you're expecting to go eat or you relax or dig in for the night. And then, yeah, you, you're called back. I, I can't imagine what, what that must do to you. So can you speak to a couple of the people I've interviewed? As you know, they, uh, could or could not be considered lightning rods and, and, uh, and people, uh, comment, but, you know, so I, I, I read some of the stuff and it's funny because I get a lot of people talking, calling you, you and Bob specifically like bullies, right? And I'm like, they say way more harsh things as you're very aware of, but which is, it's also silly to me. I don't, I don't know why these people are anyway, whatever. That's a whole nother topic. But my, my question in that is, 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 is what is your response to that negative commentary on, on what you're doing? Where are these people crying when the prosecution screws over people? Like, you know, when, when, when they are bullying or when the, when the, when the police and the state and everyone is out in the public saying things that are incorrect or villainizing, you know, this, um, innocent man for all intents and purposes prior to trial. I mean, obviously this happens outside of Adnan's case and in, in, in tons of cases. That's how the process works. They, they charge, they go to the media, they talk, blah, 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 blah. It just kind of is what it is. So when people are upset with, with you and your work and like even in this case with Adnan, folks would say that, you know, you've, you've, I think, I think this might be an actual quote. <laughs> you rallied an angry mob and have, you know, are, are now, you know, basically bullying the state into, uh, trying th- to get them to, uh, to do this, whatever. So, <laughs> right. So, so anyway, I, I'm sure you've heard that criticism before and, and I, I, I assume you have anyway. And I just want to kind of get your opinion on, on that. Well, you know what, I'm not going to take anybody seriously if you're like a random internet anonymous troll because you are just a troll. You are a faceless, nameless troll who's irrelevant. If you have the courage of your conviction, fucking come out into the light, tell us who you are, and tell us why you think a certain way. Um, now, it's not considered bullying if you attack me and I defend myself, right? Right. If you come at me and you say horrible things to me, there's a reason me, my brother, I've known brother, Susan Simpson, Colin Miller, Bob Ross, Asia McLean, uh, Christy, Vincent, that we all left this up because this is like this, and it's honestly, I think, I, I'm not even kidding, I think it's like literally between three and five people who have lots of different soft accounts and have, are really committed. But this, the, the, the interesting thing is, I mean, because I've actually figured out who some of them, we know exactly who they are. Oh, okay. They're also the same people who are Amanda Knox Gilders and <laughs> they have this obsession with people that they are, that, like their life. I don't know if they just have nothing to do in their lives. But what happened was, we all left because, like, you're just fucking abusive, and so we're not going to give you any oxygen. Uh, but they'll, they'll find you online, you know, on Twitter or whatever. And, yeah, if you're going to come at me, I promise you're going to get it back. You are absolutely going to get it. You're not allowed. I do not give you permission to abuse me. Right. And uh, so if defending myself is bullying, then you can call me whatever you want. I don't care. But in the grand scheme of things, you know, my father taught me something uh, growing up, he said it to me a thousand times. It's, an, it's a saying, you know, in, in from Pakistan and Urdu and so some other languages, that um, the dogs bark and caravans continue. So barking <laughs> dogs will be irrelevant to my caravan. Right. My caravan will continue. Correct. And, um, you know, this is something we've been work- I've been working on for 15 years, and now 17, you know, since serial started. So they don't know me. They don't know Bob. Bob is an amazing person. Now, they... You want to talk about bullying? You have the state trying to intimidate a witness in a case. First, a state prosecutor talked Asia out of coming to testify. Right. Then you have this new prosecutor, Vira Vignaraja, who did everything he could to intimidate her in a court of law, you know, in a hearing, and, and even during uh, during his little press conferences that he had, where he's like, you know, the families will be upset that Asia is coming forward. What the hell kind of attorney are you? Why would you prevent a witness from testifying to what she believes is the truth? Right. Um, so that is bullying. That is harassment. I have never reached out to a single witness in this. I've never contacted Jay Wilde. None of us have. And so we don't harass anybody. We don't bully anybody. We are just investigating the case like we should. Um, and there have been amazing people online who have come forward and supported us and have helped with the investigation. The trolls are trolls, and they're just, you know, I just think they're people who don't have a lot. I would never have the time and energy and willpower 
to spend that much vitriol um, on like a complete stranger. <laughs> right. Like, Don't you have a life? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, and the weird, and that's the crazy thing. I'm like, yeah, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not. That's not what I'm. Uh, that's not what I'm here for. And as far as the the investigative tactics and or what about the thought that you all might be antagonizing or taunting the police and or state like uh, those are harsh words. But in, in that regard, so not from a troll perspective, but just from the pointed comments about the state and, and the police. Any 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 worry there? Or, I mean, or, since when do we live in a since when do we live in a society when public servants that are paid by our tax dollars are not held to account? Correct. Well, we actually do live in that society, but the thing is, they should be held to account, and this is not new. In any kind of, uh, I mean, the media has been doing this forever, advocates have been doing this forever, saying this prosecutor's dirty, this cop is dirty, this judge is dirty, they have to be called out. Like, it's taunting the state, the state, which has more power than any of us could imagine, right? Like, we, who is David and who is Goliath here? Right, right, right. Um, people on Twitter... You know, might be hurting somebody's feelings, but you have fucked up people's lives and put them away in prison and destroyed their families. Let's get it straight here about who has the power. The least I can do is name it and call it out. And so, um, I'm going to continue to do that. And, you know, for, for, you know, people say, oh, well, that, they're just doing their jobs. Do your jobs ethically. I have a job. I don't do it. You know, I don't cheat people. Right. I don't hide evidence. I don't lie. I don't, right. I don't even do your job ethically, and I will respect you. But, you know, and, and when Ciro Vignola just signs his name to a brief, when he's the one arguing in the court of law, I hold him accountable for that. I'm not going to say, well, the state of Maryland will play really dirty today. No, I'm going to say this person is doing these things wrong because they, sh- they should be held to account. He can do his job right, but he's choosing not to. Right, I agree. I mean, you know, something as simple as when... <laughs> He's misrepresenting what the library location and, and the high and the high school and the, the the terms where I'm like and you went to the high school so so yes I'm like that's but anyway. I mean you know and, and we use the word misrepresent these are it's a nice way to say he's lying okay um in, at the PCR hearing you know so many things happened at the PCR hearing that should that would just reflect his lack of integrity and the lack of integrity and I bet you he has colleagues who cringe. Uh, and one of them is the entire drama that he created around, Your Honor, my next witness of the two stellar witnesses that he presented, by the way, <laughs> um, is this is this officer who's going to testify that he remembers that his mom was not at the library. Oh my gosh! But he has been bullied online, and we need to protect his anonymity. Um, you know, he harassed the judge until the judge did something that's like almost unheard of, which is say, "Okay, your witness can testify anonymously without giving his name." That poor guy got out there, and the first thing he said was, my name is Officer Steve Mills. <laughs> you know why? Because the, the, the prosecutor made all that shit up. Right. He just lied. He lied to the judge about all that. Officer Steve Mills was not feeling harassed or threatened. He probably has never been on Twitter. He has no idea what's going on. And that poor man, thank God, was honest. He was just like, I had no idea what happened on January 13th. I don't know. Maybe there are cameras, maybe they weren't. Um, but, but you have a prosecutor, that's misrepresenting, but Straight outline. And, and, and that seems to happen a lot. And these convictions seem to, you know, and, and now because of you, because of this case and you bring it to Sarah's attention and all and everything we've already discussed ad nauseum here and, and beyond, you know, it's like all these things are highlighted and it's not unique to Adnan. It's not unique to Maryland or Thiru or, or any of this. Like this is happening like literally like I, we did a, a show about, Police integrity lost, and uh, and we were talking about, you know, you watch the news and bad things happen. Cops do things in your city, and you don't necessarily under, rem, think about, but that's happening like everywhere. You know, like everything you see on the news is happening in every city in the country. You know, every rural area in the country, it's happening. It's so prevalent and so scary. So, I, I, I'm just, I'm just very hopeful. Obviously, that everybody. I don't know. Uh, when I was uh, Colin blogged about this not too long ago um, in California. And the reason it keeps happening is because there's no accountability. Because prosecutors, the same prosecutor, judge can find, like literally make a legal ruling that yes, you committed a Brady violation, you withheld evidence, and nothing happens to that prosecutor. They will not lose their law license. They will continue to be a prosecutor. They might even become judges. Right now in the state of California, there, our local legislator has introduced a bill that would make that a felony. That when a prosecutor is found to be withholding evidence willfully, um, mostly, uh, that they, 
won't be charged with a felony. That's the kind of change we need. Because that might stop them from doing it. Right. If cops are killing people on camera, uh, and they actually get indicted and they get arrested for murder, maybe that'll stop them from doing it. But right now, it's complete impunity. It's the Wild West. Right. Yeah. But me- meanwhile, they bring the hammer down on small crimes or innocent people. And, and it's just because, because it, it always leads me back to the, in, in the movie Training Day, you know, it's an old movie now, but he says, you know, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And, and I, I feel like, and right. I, and I feel like that's prevalent in, in all of these cases here where the prosecution, you know, we talk about, you know, good evidence versus bad evidence and how these cases are made. The shifting narrative, it's like the, you know, Adnan's story remains steadfast. Joy Watkins' story remains steadfast. But the prosecution is the one always jumping and moving, trying to fit this one story for this, you know, put this square peg in this round hole all the darn time. And, and I feel like that's like people just lose that. Do you, do you think that this, that actual progress is on the way? I mean, you talk about that in introduction of that uh, bill there, but do you think that, you know, surely now with everything that's happening, let's send serial, post serial, that we're on a way where either this won't happen as often or people are going to be more mindful of and really be looking? Do you think that is... Well, look, um, you know, these changes, and one of the difficulties here is that um, the changes have to be made state by state. And Okay, uh, right, right. At a, pol- at a policy level, we're talking about, like, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, but um, I would say we are at a moment in time that is ripe for reform. I feel like for people who have been, at, and, and really, there are people, people who have been working for decades on these issues, Correct. decades on police reform, criminal justice reform, on Canada, for, but they haven't gotten the attention needed um, to create the political and public will to make the change, right? They need a lot of support. They need the legislators to say, you're right, this is an issue. We, I think, are getting close to um, a shift in public opinion on criminal justice um, because you know, we have always been a nation of um, retribution and not rehabilitation, right? We've always been about punitive um, punishment, not like so many other countries in the world, in, in the Western world even, that don't incarcerate the people the way we do. We don't, I mean, like, you know, we, right now Bob Ruff is working on a case where this man was convicted of, I think, like, of armed robbery, and he's probably innocent, but then you have a conviction of armed robbery of less than $2,000, 40 years for that. Yeah, Kenny oh, Snow, right. Years. Right. Yeah, Anders Braddock in Norway killed 20, I uh, know, killed 67 people, gunned them down, got 25 years. We incarcerate people in a way that no other country in the world does. So if we, if there is now a slight public awareness and shift, I would say to all the advocates who've been working on these issues, this is your time to jump. This is your time to take all of this media, this, you know, a disattention, to really use it to try to influence policymakers. Um, and try to get legislation passed. These are the moments you don't want to let this like go by. Basically, it's a, it's just a matter of see what happened with serial for me, because I am very good at recognizing like the opportunities and like the openings and say this is it. This is the moment in time. If I don't take advantage of this, like we're gonna lose. I knew when serial ended, I said we're gonna lose the momentum on this case very quickly. People get bored, they move on to another season, another person, and they'll forget it's on. And I can't let that happen. And so. We have to take advantage of, of opportunities, and those things go by very quickly. No doubt. Right. I'm glad you have that mindset. I think we all are, and a lot of people are, are benefiting because of that. And hey, you believe that Adnan is coming home, and that's good. So obviously, we want him to benefit from uh, from this. Can you tell us exactly where Adnan sits today? Yeah, with Adnan's uh, case right now, you know, his conviction was vacated. His presumption of innocence was returned to him. What the state did was file something called, and the judge ordered a new trial. What the state did was file, file something called an application for leave to appeal, which is a, it's, a, it's an application to ask the appellate court, can we appeal? <laughs> it's not an actual appeal. Oh, okay. Because they don't have a right to automatically appeal this. Now, if the court says, if the appellate court COSA says, no, you're, we, are, we are denying you permission, that's the end of it. Like, they can't. So they haven't appealed it. They're just asking, can we appeal? Um, and so until the appeal is granted, until the court says, yes, you may appeal, they file the appeal, that then puts kind of a hold on the judge's order, on Judge Welch's order, and, and basically have to wait to see what happens with, with the appeal. Do they win or do we win? Because we are cross appealing this. Um, and, you know, so he has to just wait. I mean, this could take another year, maybe two, 
get to the appellate system. So I don't think it'll take more than a year, but because really the, his case has been moving faster than most cases do through the courts in the last couple of years, uh, probably because of the attention. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, if, if, if his, if the judge's ruling is upheld, the state has to decide. Do they want to try him? Or do they want to give him a plea deal? Or what are they going to do? And then we have to decide what we're going to do. But the ball is going to be in their court at that point. And we'll see. I mean, whether they, if they want to go to trial, we are very prepared to go to trial. And I think we're fine with that. I like that. Like, bring it on. If they want to go, let's go. I love that idea. So, Rabia, thank you so much for coming on and talking about the book, Adnan's Story. I know it's available everywhere, but if you want to tell folks where they can, how they can get that and, and anything else you want to talk about and or promote so folks can be engaged and continue to support Adnan and the movement to uh, free him and obviously others that have been wrongfully convicted as well, but uh, specifically, you know, Adnan's story. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, the book website is adnanstory.com, but really it's available in most outlets, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, many, many other booksellers online, and um, it's an ebook, audio, all of it, every format you want. Uh, it's doing very well. We've had over 10,000 sales at the first week, so it's really it's doing extraordinarily well, and the critical reviews are, are fantastic, too. So it's, it's you know, I'm glad that not only I went ahead and wrote the book, but actually it's being well-received. Um, but I do hope people listen to um, our second case on Undisclosed because there are many more people who deserve um, the same kind of attention and support as Adnan has. And, uh, you know, we were worried a little bit about, you know, we were we, we followed up serial, so obviously we're going to have kind of a built-in audience. Um, we want to make sure Joey gets that kind of attention. Uh, so far, we, we have gotten a lot of, our, our listenership is very high and it's going well, but uh, people should pay attention to this case because, you know what, they're going to notice a lot of um, similarities, even though it's a very different case. Uh, Joey Watkins, young white boy from rural Georgia, um, and it's done. A lot of these wrongful convictions have very similar red flags, and people should, and it's also a really crazy thing that's just going to get crazier as we continue to unfold it throughout the season. I mean, teenage love, you know, girl, like there's, right. there's, there's so many... It's too, it's way too convenient. Yeah, it it sounds eerily similar to the conclusion of Adnan's case at, at points. So yeah, it's def, it's both compelling and entertaining, but it's sad. You know, that's the thing about all these cases where it's like you know the entertainment is like the third tier. It's kind of like okay now, now what do we do? You know, like you know what's the next right. step here? So so yeah, no, it's it's well, powerful. I feel, um, I feel like we're gonna be able to you know I, because the point point of this was not um, just to entertain people, but obviously we want to help exonerate Joey and that's of course our purpose. And I think. I think we'll, I think we'll actually be able to help get him in trial. I'm hopeful for that and hopeful for everything that you're doing. So again, thank you, Rabia, for coming on the Vocal Minority Report. Me. Things die down for you. Maybe we can talk about, uh, have you back on and talk about Islam and some other stuff like that too. Sure. I'd love to do that. Awesome. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Are right, you too. Bye bye. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the conversation with Rabia Chowdhury. Appreciate her time. She's very gracious. Make sure you follow her at Rabia Squared, R-A-B-I-A Squared on Twitter. Tweet her nice things and check out the Undisclosed podcast. You can find them on Twitter as well. Make sure you check out their show. Follow the case of Joy Watkins, the one they're highlighting now. Also, make sure you go get Adnan's story. Continue to support him, his movement. Hashtag free ad non. Go now. Go to iTunes. Leave a five star rating review. Make sure you check out some of my other favorite podcasts The Black Neighbors, Walden, Egypt. They talk about their lives, living in suburban Atlanta, and parenting, churching, everything that goes with it. My man, Miles Weekly, over at the Miles Weekly Finance Podcast. Check him out. Insightful commentary on financing. My girls over at Cardigans and Conversations, check them out. Really good conversations, really good laughs, and support Black Podcasts. Check everybody out, especially the independent ones. They need the shine. The big ones are great, but the independent podcasts out here, the independent Black Podcasts, continue to support them. And we'll talk to you next episode. Peace.